Uh, my name is Sarah Fisher from Open Eye Gallery, and I'm really delighted to have you all with us this morning. Um, and we have some very distinguished guests. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, creating a culture of energy efficiency uh, in our homes. Um, and this, this um, event is part of a wider event that's going on from Open Eye Gallery, which is called um, Look Climate Lab. And we have over 30 national, local um, and international um, partners, all of whom are looking at different aspects of the climate agenda and the agency that we all have um, as individuals and as groups in trying to address the issues that we face in terms of the climate agenda. So to start today, I'm going to ask everybody to introduce themselves firstly, and we're incredibly privileged to have with us um, Liverpool City Region's Metro Mayor, Steve Rotherham. I wonder if, if Steve could introduce himself, but also perhaps talk a little bit about what, what he's doing in this area and what's happening within the city region. Yeah, my name is Steve Rotherham. I'm the Metro Mayor of the Liverpool City Region, and that's six districts, Holton, Knowsley, Liverpool, St. Helens, Sefton and the Wirral. And we have a devolution agreement with government that we uh, struck in 2015 um, and I was elected in 2017 and, and the recent elections provided I think a significant mandate for us now to do some of those bold things that we had in the manifesto and one of those was to lead um, on climate emergency and, and certainly environmental uh, consequences in the city region. Um, I think probably um, which will take us to a preeminent position in the country. Of course, that's the ambition. But why do I say that? And I say that because we have some unbelievable assets, um, not least of which is something called the River Mersey. And if we're able to harness its power, then we could create not only enough clean, renewable, predictable energy to power a million homes, but also through electrolysis and hydrolysis, um, hydrolysis or whatever it's called, um, we can get some green hydrogen. And we are looking at our transport system and our energy uh, supplies. And of course, those energy intensive industries that we have in abundance in some areas in the city region, we're looking to see whether we can start to really address some of those fundamentally um, more polluting industries and sectors with what potentially we might be able to derive from um, the power of the River Mersey. So that's why I think that we could become Britain's renewable energy coast. That's an amazing aspiration and really, really exciting. Um, thanks for sharing that, that with us. And I wonder if I could just bring in um, Richard Fitton. Um, Richard, would you like to introduce yourself and talk about what you're doing in this area? Uh, good morning. My name is Richard. I work at the University of Salford. Uh, I run a couple of um, laboratories that we have here looking at energy efficiency in buildings. So we have the Energy House, which is a, a Victorian terrace, which is similar to buildings that we have right, right the way across the UK. And we have a new lab that's just about to open, which is looking at the new build sector. So that will have four uh, houses in, in a very, very large environmental chamber. So what we do is we look at how uh, the different energy efficiency measures that we put into buildings affect its energy performance uh, and also how people get on with those measures, why people may or may not take the measures up uh, and what difference it makes to their lives, including things like uh, their well-being and thermal comfort and things like this. So we're about examining uh, how we can make buildings more efficient uh, and obviously uh, affect the environment much less than they currently are doing. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Richard. And and John, could I bring you in now from Groundworks? Yeah, morning, everyone. Um, my name is John. I'm the uh, Programme Director for Communities and Environment at Groundwork Cheshire, Lancashire and Merseyside. Um, Groundwork is a federation of charities uh, working across the UK, primarily on programmes related to uh, either environment or poverty or a cross section of the both. Um, one of those programmes that we deliver is called Green Doctor. Um, it's a national one-to-one -one support project um, that provides uh, support to individual homes within the home setting 
and it's focused on lifting households out of fuel poverty. Um, nationally, in a, in, a, in a typical year, we would support anywhere between 80 and 100,000 properties with one-to-one -one support, which is primarily focused on kind of understanding energy bills and installing small, low-cost energy saving devices to improve energy efficiency and, and, and tackle some of the most common issues within, within poor quality housing, such as damp condensation mould. Um, and also adopting behaviour to maximise the efficiency of energy using technologies within the properties. That's brilliant, John. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll hear more from, from the three of you. For us, obviously, uh, as a gallery and a civic space for the next few months, as we discuss this, we are very keen to look at artists' role within this agenda. And we have two artists with us. I wonder, uh, Steph and Steve, if you could introduce yourself and what you're doing on this area. Hi, I'm Stephanie Wynn. Wynn. This is Steve McCoy, and we're McCoy Wynn. We're, we're two phot photographers who collaborate together. Shall I just share my screen just to show an image while we're talking? Is that okay? Yep. Right. right can everybody see that image? Yep. So I'll just make it a bit bigger. Uh, so we're two photographers. Um, we work collaboratively, as I said. Um, we work for commissions um, and also commissioned as, as artists. We've got a lifelong interest in the environment and landscape, particularly the, the urban environment. And we've spent a lot of time um, looking at the built environment and, and down from a level, domestic level, to sort of huge building projects. And it's something that really interests us. Um, so this picture, um, we just thought we'd show this one because this was one of the images that we've produced um, as part of the commission um, from Open Eye Gallery and Salford University, um, which was documenting and re-envisioning really um, the energy house um, as an artwork. And we collaborated as we always do together and we collaborated with with Richard and the team at Energy House to produce this set of images that is now on display in the open eye. You yeah, I mean, I think um, you can see from this photograph here that, that the Energy House, although it's been sort of added to, manipulated a little bit, you can see its position within this, this lab, which was, you know, quite a large warehouse. Um, our brief was, was really quite open and we spent uh, a few weeks researching and talking to scientists before we started to develop the ideas that uh, we finalised and then we're on show in the Open Eye Gallery. Um, and we kind of like wanted to envision the house as it, as it might be um, with greenery around it. Um, some of the interiors also we've, we've put in sort of uh, some of the furniture that you might expect in, in a house. Um, and I think uh, we might touch on this a bit later on, but, but kind of uh, we were very conscious that we wanted to um, engage the public really in issues around climate change and energy usage and obviously being visual artists um, you know we wanted to entertain people we wanted to draw people in so that when they look at the work not only are they sort of like stimulated by the sort of the photographs but they start to think more about their own lives and what they can do even on a small scale to conserve energy. Brilliant thank you guys um... So, um, as I say, the, the, the idea behind this event is, is actually looking at our agency. And as, we, as you can see, we've got people with very, very differ, differing agency. Um, but I'd like to ask you all the first question, um, which is, um, what do you think the main challenges are when it comes to how we, you know, when it comes to energy efficiency in our homes, particularly, what, what do we feel are the main challenges. Um, Steve, could we start with you, please? I think there are a number of them. The, the, the first one is um, to ensure that there's a, a complete and comprehensive assessment of housing stock so we can identify um, what type, what state um, each of our properties are in. And we've been conducting that in the Liverpool City region, so we, we've got a fairly good idea of what interventions are needed. And then the most pressing uh, issue, of course, is always the funding to do that. So we, we reckon we need to intervene on about 720,000 properties, 440,000 of which are below 
any acceptable standard. And by doing that, we can reduce emissions by a third across the, the city region. Um, we've already started, we're, we're, we're doing some really good work now. Uh, and as we speak, houses are being um, retrofitted. Uh, and what we're trying to do, of course, is to ensure that we tackle some of the, the, the waste um, insulated homes first, but also some of those waste insulated homes happen to be in some of the more deprived areas of the city region. And therefore, uh, the people who are living there are not only paying money to heat outside because they're losing the heat through doors and windows and roofs, but also many of those people are paying a premium on their energy bills because they are electric card meters. And as we know, that's more expensive per unit than if you have a direct debit. So it's a double whammy for people. Uh, and the way I think that we can get the message out and perhaps engage more with people is to explain that actually green and uh, environmental justice is social justice as well. It's the right thing to do for the planet, but also it's the right thing to do for people, for human beings as well, who are struggling. So we're trying to have a, a two-pronged uh, approach to this, whereas we think that we can make significant inroads, but we will need um, about 12 billion pounds to enable us to do everything to the standard that we'd like to do it. But, and we're only currently getting tens of millions of pounds, which is, you know, it's a big chunk of money, but it's going to take us a long, long time to do it. Um, the other thing that we believe that we can see derive the benefits from is the skill side of things because there, there are probably going to be 220,000 green jobs off the grabs. We think that conservatively we can get at least 10,000 of those good jobs. And that in itself helps to tackle the issues because those people will be in good, well paid to say sustainable jobs. And that will help the economy. And of course, the more buoyant our economy, the more likely that we'll get the ability through the funding regime that we have to do more um, of the retrofitting. So it's a, it's a very strategic approach that we have, but we think at this moment in time, we can demonstrate some real progress. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, John? Yeah, I, I guess from my perspective, um, the question is the the idea of energy efficiency and improving energy efficiency in homes is not just about infrastructure. Um, for me, the, there are equal savings that can be made by ad adopting energy efficient behaviours. I think you can have the most energy efficient property in the world with the best heating system, the best ventilation. If you don't operate that correctly, you will still just be wasting energy. You've, you've got the heating on and the windows are open, that sort of activity. So. For me, one of the biggest challenges is kind of the policy around infrastructure changes, which, which I completely agree with. I think we should be retrofitting properties, but we need to make sure that the technical know-how of how to operate existing systems and new systems isn't forgotten within this whole piece of moving towards a greener economy. Um, and particularly around those that the, the properties that are probably in the worst condition, the um, residents of those, some of those properties may uh, certainly our experience has been poor of property condition often is um, individuals that have more complex lifestyles and therefore the information around energy efficient behaviour is not necessarily always accessible. So it's how do we engage with those individuals and, and create information that they're empowered to make changes within their own lifestyles and they're comfortable in their own knowledge of how to operate in, a, in an energy efficient way as much as possible. So we've got two great, great ways forward. We've got the infrastructure and discussions about how we develop the infrastructure. And we have um, John with his, his very hands-on um, and people focused uh, approach, which is about behavioral change as well, um, you know, and how to support people on behavioral change. Richard, I know that both of those things are um, 
of of value in in your work. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you how you perceive our main challenges. Yeah, I, I think um, that the challenge now is going to possibly come either easier or, or more difficult. But as we can see, the gas prices are going to absolutely shoot through the roof in the next. Uh, in the next year, at least, maybe the next two years. So what, life is going to become a lot more stressful in terms of paying the energy bills. And I think that's going to put a lot of pressure on people, which is a terrible thing, but it may also you know, have the effect that people start to zone in a little bit more on how they could save energy and, and thus save carbon and th things like this. So it, we, we could find that, you know, as Steve was saying, that, that more, more funding could be attracted. That's certainly going to help. Uh, we can put a lot of money into something and still have to convince people to, to take the measures up. Um, loft insulation is, is a classic. Um, there's still, you know, hundreds of thousands of lofts that aren't insulated. It's a very simple measure, but it also involves quite an amount of upheaval, you know, moving the suitcases and the Christmas tree out of the loft, things like this. But when you look at a measure that can save, you know, around a third of the energy that, that's leaving the building, it's an incredibly important thing to do. So I think that there's, I, I'm, a, I'm a technical person, uh, but the, the, the technical stuff we're well on the way with. Um, like Steve said, that the, the assessment of the buildings, the, the mitigation of the risk of, of installing insulation to buildings is, is being dealt with and it's being dealt with very well, I think. Um, but it is this, this whole idea of convincing people to do what is quite a, a substantial amount of work to, to the building. But the counter to that is, is the points that John makes. Uh, and that is something that, that we've studied and things like closing your curtains, different, you know, uh, better quality carpets, you know, th things that are kind of throw away measures, if you like, um, but they can still have a big effect, you know, two, three, four percent on curtains for the global heat loss of a building, carpets, again, a couple of percent. But all these things do make a difference. Uh, and if you are going to, you know, change, you know, the, the fittings and fixtures in your building, then just that little bit extra can, can kind of save a bit. So I think we've got to look at everything. We've got to look at the big infrastructure. We've got to look at the, the capital investment that's needed across everywhere, you know, um, across the, the country as a whole. Uh, then we've got to teach people a little bit more about how they can save energy by, you know, the correct settings and things like this. And and then obviously the, 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 the installation of all this equipment and, the final point I think I like to make is that John covered it well, is we can put all these new technologies in, air source heat pumps and things like this, coupled with well insulated buildings. But we are going to have to, as a nation, start to, to learn how to use all these different things as well. And some people will get on with them, some people won't. Uh, and I think our job as, as academics and researchers and, and people who deal with industry on, on a daily basis is to make these systems easy to use. Otherwise, I don't think they will ever get the traction that they need if we can make them attractive that that's that's a that's the point that needs to be uh stressed the greatest i think because um we shouldn't sell energy efficiency we should sell things like thermal comfort um cost savings you'll live in a nice cozy environment you know that that's 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 the kind of words that people like to hear as well not just kilowatt hours you know i think that's a, a dangerous road to go down um, I agree with you. I mean, after spending a little bit of time with Richard, I realised that he's a great communicator. Um, so many of the complex things that he's studying, um, I now understand in a way that I didn't before. And which brings us nicely to the artists. I mean, obviously, from our point of view, we're very public facing. We've done a lot of work with young people. And I think there is a difference between young people's approach, which is very much about their future and their um, in, in endeavor, you know, engagement with the climate agenda more broadly, but feeling of impotence in that scenario. Um, but a lot of the conversations that they're having aren't necessarily with their parents about how do we make our house more energy efficient. And I think uh, for us, uh, as a photography organisation, we're very aware that the photographs that are always normally shown in terms of the climate agenda are of disaster, of fires and floods, things which people feel impotent on. So actually, we're really keen to be working with photographers to actually change that, those, those images that are going out via social media and, and endeavour to actually develop some images which are 
talking about our agency in this people's agency within this arena. Um, and to that end, we, we brought in Steph and Steve. So um, I'm wondering if I can ask you the same question in terms of communicating um, the work that Richard's been developing and our understanding of that building. What did you feel were the main challenges uh, in terms of communicating with the broader public? Yeah, I mean, I think um, just if I go first. I mean, I think one of the challenges was obviously trying to translate hard science, uh, which obviously what you know Richard is is involved with into um, a visual medium, and and to try and engage an audience. That was the you know one of the issues really, and um, and I think it's it's just the start. I think the work at the Open Eye Gallery that we've got on display within that context of an Open Eye Gallery, who will it attract? And I realise Sarah's you know, worked very hard to bring in a whole range of people into the gallery, which is which is very laudable. But in many ways, I think now we've got to think about where does the work go next? How do we engage a wider audience? How do we get the members of the public to participate in some of the concerns that um, you know we're dealing with, really? Um, and we're very keen through through public sort of exhibitions and, and publications to try and to try and you know get that work out to people and to get them thinking about some of these major concerns that are going to affect us all. I mean, I think also another another challenge, really, I think that we sort of realised quite early on um, was that so much of the work that they're doing at the Energy House um, in Salford was the work, this word thermal comfort came up all the time. It was this idea of comfort. It was the idea, and we sort of associated that idea of comfort with the idea of home. Um, and I think that ha that is, is a word that is really important mm. in this because it's about you know how that people in their own homes can see themselves as comfortable as, as see themselves as safe yeah. um and and that's really been quite important to us getting across that idea that what what they're doing is a scientific base in this research base is actually about manageable comfort for all of us and i think that's something that was really important mm. that we got across yeah. It's brilliant and it, and it does come across in the images um, because you've ghosted in home over the top of the what was a very lab like space. Um, so, um, and it actually brings me to um, um, a, a, a question, a conversation that um, we had with John earlier, um, um, which, which was really kind of thinking about um, how do we work together? How do we work collaboratively? Because I think within this room, we have that infrastructure voice in Steve. You know, we've got the scientists, we've got the people that work on the ground, and we've got the cultural sector um, endeavouring to, to draw in more people. Um, I'm just wondering, um, it's not structured, we've, we've, we've all come together for this particular conversation, but I'm wondering how people feel we could perhaps better work together to make sure that what the messages that we're getting out there and the work that we're doing um, enables all of us to reach our ultimate goals of working with the public and making them feel that they have real agency in this agenda. Um, Steve, would you like to feedback? You can probably see that um, I'm moving around the room because somebody's trying to, to, to fix uh, the computer. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll just come back on something that John said earlier, just to, to push back a little bit, um, and, and that's all about good debate, uh, which is, he, he mentioned people with chaotic lives, and, and quite rightly so, that those people um, do need to be educated about behavioural changes, and that, and that can help them, obviously, um, economically. But most people who are poor um, are doing everything within their power to ensure that they don't lose heat I actually think the other end of the spectrum is where we'll see significant savings in emissions. People, you know, who have swimming pools, leave them on all, all winter and don't use them. Um, but that's far more than um, a lot of houses in the, the Liverpool city region combined. So it is both ends of the spectrum and we shouldn't forget about education. It's not just about people who happen to live in deprived communities. We need to change behaviours and the culture that has to be said across the country you know especially demographically so for my age group i'm one of those that grew up in a household eight kids and we threw everything in the bin you know my kids are being brought up and they understand these things from day one so it's i'd say it's us you know we've caused a lot of lots of the problems our, our age group 
uh, and we need to change our behaviours. Uh, whereas I think younger people are far more willing and able. But my, my role at, at a sort of strategic level is to see what are those big interventions that we can do. So I know there's a huge debate and we might come to it on hydrogen and the issue around blue hydrogen especially. But unless we start to build the infrastructure now for when we hopefully do get green hydrogen, then we'll have missed the boat because it will be sort of like the people talk about VHS and Betamax. I think it's more like Western House uh, and um, what happened uh, uh, around electricity, isn't it? Uh, and, you know, we, we didn't potentially get the best solution there. And the same could be lost with hydrogen because it's not perfect today and we need to work towards that. And, you know, let's not uh, perfect be the enemy of good. I think we can do some really good stuff now. So we're looking, for instance, at using hydrogen, trial and hydrogen in gas supplies with Cadence uh, in St. Helens. And that will be about 21% because of the mix. Again, people who are my age will remember the conversion to naughty gas and somebody had to come round and it was a bloke, wasn't it, in a blue suit, British gas, and he changed the elements or the, the burners on all of those things, like a big Ascot heater that you had, hot water. And what we don't need is the billions of pounds of additional costs passed on to individual people because they will shy away then from the benefits of the uh, environmental uh, issues and look at the power notes rather than what we can do um, about saving the earth. So we're, we're trialing that. We've also had the, the world's first successful trial in using hydrogen for energy intensive industries. And that was again in St. Helens and Pilkington's. And we can save a third of all the emissions globally through this process. Um, again, if we get the green hydrogen, so we have to produce the right stuff. But we're trialing it currently to see whether hydrogen can work, and it does. So at, at a, a macro level, we're doing lots and lots of good things. We'll treble the amount of wind generated at Burbo Bank, uh, which is Europe, still Europe's, Europe's largest offshore wind cluster. So there are big, big things that we can do, but I, I absolutely agree that what we need to do is to balance all those things out. Yes, do huge, big projects, but also individually, we can all do our little bit to try to save the world. I think that's really interesting. So there's, there's a kind of a, a question for me, but obviously I've looked at, at the website and, and uh, all of the work that you're doing on the website. And I suppose there's a question for me always around what can the cultural sector do to help? Because it's, it's whether do people know about this? You know, what are the fears about hydrogen and how do we start to have a conversation, um, you know, with, with the public about things which um, if we're asking the public to um, um, engage and adopt, um, and particularly if we're working with the, the young people who want to engage and adopt um, um, new technologies and want to work towards a climate agenda, um, you know, how do we how do we affect, more effectively do that? Um, you know, how do we more effectively work? And I know that the culture team in Liverpool City region are very keen to work with the cultural sector on that. Um, and and um, John, also, I know that your work on the ground is very sort of uh, people focused. Um, how do you feel that you could kind of connect in with people around the, you know, the potential changes that are coming? I mean, particularly around, as, as Richard said, you know, the gas bills are going to change, aren't they? And a sort of sense of people moving forward and their ability to move forward. Um, and certainly in terms of government grants, I know that there have been grants which have been more difficult in terms of people taking them up. The grants up as well, um, probably because of the disruption that Richard talked about earlier. You know, what do you think we could do better together to enable this the message to get out and to engage a broader public in in a way that works for them? Yeah, I, I think I think the the issue is that the whole of the energy market is is complex and overly complex. So the from where you get your gas and electric from 
the bills, all of that is complex. And the energy using technology within properties is complicated and, and massively varied. Um, I think from my perspective, how, how we can collaborate better to create more public engagement, it's about kind of clear, continuous and consistent messaging around pro-environment behaviours. So not just about energy, but around anything that you can adopt in your life that is pro-environment. There's a huge amount of research that shows if you engage in some form of pro-environment action, whether that is energy efficiency, whether that is um, community food growing, dietary changes, it has a knock-on effect. And I think because the marketplace is so complicated, whether it's purchasing energy or using energy, the messaging is also complicated and quite often inaccessible. I think what we as a group of organisations share and what everybody listening to this call shares is we speak to people on a daily basis, whether that's through our professional life, whether that's through our personal lives, we go about society interacting with others. And the one thing that we can do is create and share these messages and create a culture where people have pro-environment behaviours, pro-energy efficient behaviours, and they're happy to talk about that and to share their experiences. I think it goes back to, to the point raised around the messages around climate change are often catastrophe messages. Actually, we should be put, promoting the positives around an energy efficient home, more money in your back pocket, less health conditions related to poor um, with poor insulation and colder homes and and quite often it's the other side that gets the that gets the 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 media coverage whereas i think if we agreed and we created these kind of shared messaging uh, we could have a massive impact on on people's choices that they make whether that's purchasing new equipment whether that's you're you're looking at the carpet specification when you're having your bedroom carpets done or whether that's adopting energy efficient behaviors in other ways. I think the only way to do that is a shared and consistent messaging program um, that, that everybody buys into. And I think there's a massive role for the cultural organizations to have in shaping what that looks like, using the information that Richard and his team have got from the technology side, using the information that we will generate from the housing stock survey that Steve's team are involved in, bringing all of that together we can create the information that will, will lead to people consciously making decisions around pro environment. Thank you. I'm just going to add to that, John, because that is a, a really good point. And from our perspective, we are very keen. We do a lot of social engaged work and we're really keen to put communities' voices in there. I was interested, I was in Prescott, we've got a project there, and I was talking to an old, old guy who was talking about his recycling you know, and, you know, how he's found somewhere to recycle the, the, the bags that he couldn't recycle previously and hit the pride in he had in doing that. I think those stories, I know they're small stories, but actually those are the stories that I think we need to share. We need to share them with the broader public because people will think that person's like me. You know, I'm like that person. I can do that. And I become then a champion for this agenda. Um, so I'd just like to add that. Richard, would you like to add anything? I would. Um, I think the cultural sector um, should and is doing, I, I would say, uh, lead by example. Um, so the, the publication that we did with Steph and Steve has the carbon footprint uh, assessment in the back of it. Uh, it tells us how much carbon we've used and, and what, you know, what we could have done better and things like this. And I think you know where we've got public spaces. They they should be um, they should be efficient. They should be as efficient as possible. I understand that there's there's cost to all these things, but we we have to uh, lead by example. And hopefully, if you can link that with cultural, you know, events and things like this, and, and draw attention to the things you're doing, um, then that's an automatic win for both parties, the people that visit, and, and, and let's face it, your bills as well. And um, so I, I think to to, it's dangerous to detach the two things that they, they should be, you know, a priority for everyone should be to, to, to save the, the planet, as Steve said. But I think if we can uh, make it entertaining, we, we can link one thing with another, then, then I think that that's a, it's a very good starting point. Uh, and, you know, we all go into uh, old museums and galleries and things that, that, that 
crazily expensive to heat and to cool and things like this. And that should be a good start for everyone, really, to, to bring, link those two to educate people. So I should just bring in, we, there is a group of us in, in uh, which I'm on the steering group of, in, in Liverpool and actually Manchester and Leeds, the North is leading on this, uh, a cultural sector who are collectively looking at how we uh, reduce our carbon, our own carbon footprint. We've reported on it for the last eight, eight, eight years uh, back to government. So it's not new for us, but we're looking at new ideas, how we can work with the public to talk about public transport, different ways of engaging with the cultural sector that are less um, um, carbon intensive. Um, we're looking at um, how we, uh, the food that we use within the gallery. We're looking at uh, people's working, work, coming into work, working from home. We're looking at the um, recycling um, 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 materials within the gallery. So that's very much on, uh, ongoing, Richard. We're, we're also looking at the moment, at, is there a possibility shift, the organization is called um, in, in the Liverpool area. And we're looking at, um, you know, is there a possibility of working with um, eco-friendly energy companies and so we are looking at that in, in the round and I think you're right it's really important we need to all change our behaviors individually and as well as as organizations and share those behaviors uh, or share the wins I suppose um, um, as, as we develop them. Um, can I bring in art artists because I think there are so many artists working with this agenda and, and in the same way, historically, the artists have been working very much on documenting the damage that, that, that climate change has had on the environment. And there is a now a big shift, I think, where artists are looking at what proactive role can they, can they um, undertake to support people to be part of this broader endeavor um i don't know whether steph and steve you want yeah. to i mean i mean just to sort of slightly go back really um it, it's part of that but really something probably that richard and both steve have said is that obviously we're here in this position of of going into the energy house taking the photographs and recording it and documenting it and, and creating something that we're hoping is accessible to the public and I think that's really important for us to be doing that or artists in general to be doing that because what Richard has talked about, what we know about is that scientific research level. And what Steve's talked about is that sort of administrative level. I mean, you know, I, I live in the Liverpool city region, Steve, and I didn't know about the, the, the work with hydrogen. I don't know about it. Um, so it's like, it, it's taking us, as artists into places and, and opening up what they do in university research teams. I mean, all around the country, all the, so many of the universities are working on research all the time. Um, and people will occasionally see outcomes of it or hear about, you know, um, our, our world beating universities that, 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 that have the focus in scientific research, but they don't necessarily hear about all the research that all the other universities are doing and all the work that they're involved with and how that affects or how it can help the rest of us. Equally, that administrative level of what's going on at a governmental level about what research is going on that can help us. And I think that's quite important that the artists and the culture sector can showcase that so that we can be a link. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, again, uh, when we started the project, we were, um, we actually tried very hard to analyse our working process in terms yeah. of how much carbon uh, and what damage do photographers have, you know, on the environment. Um, we tried to measure, you know, um, is, it, is it sort of more efficient to, say, use digital cameras, you know, with silicon chips or... Would it be less harmful for the environment to go back to the older analog cameras and use film? Um, you know, we tried very hard to to look at every aspect of what we do, traveling to the energy house, the power to charge the camera, how much power maybe each digital photograph actually consumed, the computers that we, you know, all those aspects feed into our carbon footprint. And I think it, it became so complex to try and measure that. Mm -hmm. You know, and then to think about, well, how do, is there a way we can offset that? Because obviously carbon offsetting is very much a kind of a sort of strategy. But I think we very quickly learned that the idea of carbon offsetting is, is so difficult to calculate. Well, it's, you know, it, it's impossible to work out, first of all, 
how much carbon we're using. And then, well, you know, if we don't know how much carbon we're using, then how, how can we offset it? You know, and it's a bit of a, a bit of a sort of like false strategy, I think, which, which is what we learned through talking to one or two other people. The idea that, you, you know, you publish a book and you plant a tree type of thing. You think, well, hang on a minute. You know, is that really, does that, you know, really balance out? And we, I think we learned it, it just doesn't. There are, Steve, there are, within the gallery, there's a few, um, there's a few things, uh, sort of pointers for people um, from, from the cultural sector, which, which you might want to look at. I mean, one of them is, is as you know, Red Eye is doing work with, with um, um, looking at a kind of kite mark for photographers around carbon usage, which I think, you know, might, might be useful for you to, to have a look at. And I think you know, it is a problem is that we have this gigantic issue which all of us are trying to tackle in our differing ways. And we're so, you know, it, it is a problem in that uh, it, that sort of behavioral change, which we're all kind of aiming towards um, um, more broadly in ourselves, but also more, more broadly in the public um, is going to take, it's going to take some time, isn't it? And so uh, I think perhaps that kind of question um, which I didn't give to everybody, so I'm springing this one on you. Um, and and um, perhaps it, you can you can absolutely say, well, I'm not ready to answer that at the minute. But I'm wondering if if people have thoughts about you know how we might. What are the next steps in terms of perhaps working together to look at how we might support a sort of um, a, a more more of a kind of more communication more discussion and more debate around this um steve you're used to being asked a question um of 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 peace so i'm going to start with you yeah and it follows on really doesn't it from what you just said sarah from what um steph was saying and that is there's a lot of stuff happening um but unless we communicate unless we tell people what's happening they will never fully appreciate how they can play their part in it. Because if you don't know, they, then how can you be an active member of, of whatever it is? So for instance, in our city region with our ambitious target to be net zero carbon by 2040 or significantly before, and we've gone for 2040 because Richard, like, like what's happening in Greater Manchester, we've worked with our universities here and we know that that's achievable. If we were to do some of those big projects that I've identified, that could be a significant reduction. But actually, going to what John said also, it's not just about those big things, is it? It's about everybody taking their individual part in trying to achieve those goals. So for me, I think this is where the whole thing links together, because you can use art and culture to educate and let's face it, it's a far better medium than politicians telling people what to do because we've seen what happens when somebody like a prime minister tells people what to do and the fact that everybody now, whatever politicians say, they will ignore them because there can't be one rule for us and one rule for everybody else. So a better way of doing it is through grassroots. It's it's a, you know, a bottom-up approach as well as um, the, the sort of very strategic stuff that we have to do to convince governments of the arguments. We need to take people with us. So I, I you know, some of the, the things that we've learned almost through os, of, uh, osmosis have, have been through things that we've seen or, you know, galleries we've been to or uh, exhibitions that we've had. And that might be a way that we further engage following what happened today about pulling it together. So we're, we're looking towards um, a green summit um, in a post-pandemic world. What does that mean to us? Uh, and one of the ways, and uh, sorry, one of the aspects uh, of that summit will be how do we engage with people? And that has to th be through uh, education and it will be through culture and arts. Brilliant, thank you very much. It's sort of linking yeah, to that. But, sorry. This, I'm having real problems, so this computer might go off. I will try to rejoin if it does. Okay. Yes. Yes. Don't don't worry, Steve. I, th I think we're all kind of we've so got used to the Zoom world now. I think we're all we're all used to the computers failing in the middle of of this. Um, one of the questions that we have from the floor, which I'm just going to put to you, um, Richard, um, um, is from Lindsay Taylor. 
Um, and she's very, she's very um, keen that we actually think about how we share research and uh, whether the whether the panelists, whether individuals within within this room would think about um, a, a, a kind of um, a commitment to looking at how we might share research more broadly um, with the public. Um, and I wonder what you what you feel about that, Richard. So it, it's there, there's barely any point in me sitting writing a research paper if no one's going to read it. And, and and as academics, we've all written that one paper that barely anyone has read. Um, I, we, we pride ourselves as a research group uh, by doing things like, like we're doing now, which is, you know, so we, in the art gallery, we've got two Lego models of the energy house. You know, the kids love Lego. We're not going to solve this without bringing everyone on, on board. A Lego house with insulation in it, a Lego house without insulation in it, uh, and, and a thermal camera. And, and they look at it and they can see, ah, okay, that, that's obviously the heat's coming out. because And, and my... My five-year-old understands that, and and probably more than more than some some grown-ups would do, because because it's Lego and he's interested in it, and, and it's and it's fun. Let's face it, it's fun. Um, so I I guess what we've got to do is keep doing the research, but but keep doing relevant research. You know, I, I'm not a blue sky academic. We 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 take problems and we help industry solve them, and that that's a large element of our funding as well is is by solving problems. Uh, I think what we've got to do is do research that people are interested in to start with, solve problems and get out and do this stuff, which, which we're currently doing. You know, the, the, the work we've done um, with, with Steph and Steve has been great because it, it puts the energy house out there and, and then hopefully people can see what we're doing. Uh, and, you know, we, we did the, the piece with the thermostats, which is based on fundamental physics research, which is, there's three thermostats on the wall in, in, the, li in, in the library, in the gallery, uh, and they've got prices marked on in, instead of temperature. And one of them says eat or heat. You know, that, that, that's what people need to understand, that when you retrofit your house, that dial on the wall costs far less money to use. So we can, we can bang out the figures, uh, and we do that in the energy house and the modeling, um, but unless we kind of bang out the research into the environment, it, it, it's not worth anything. Uh, and that, that's the enemy of, of what we do. Um, so, yeah, it's got to be real world. It's got to get out into the real world. It's got to solve some problems. Uh, and, and I think that, that answers the question, hopefully. Um, but, yeah, that, I think it's just what you have to do. It does, Richard. Thank you. And, and John, what do you feel we could do better together? I, it goes back to the point I, I kind of mentioned earlier. I think collectively we need to commit to creating this shared campaign that's underpinned by the academic research that people like Richard and his team are doing that includes the aspirational things that we have as a city region to achieve, um, but is in an accessible form that people can look at it and think, I'm going to do that. Um, and then we as organisations on this panel as organisations and individuals on this call, and as anybody that's interested in this, need to commit to distributing that and being the voices that are saying this is important because we can't just, you know, we can't just create a research paper and expect people to read it and then make impact. It needs to be constant, continuous, and clear messaging. And that, that for me is is often where it falls down. It, it's people create great resources but they often don't get the traction because it's not continually, continuously enforced to create that culture change. And that's the real difficult part in this is it is a cultural shift away from we've got a huge amount of resources and, and cost is not a problem to these resources are very finite. Cost is a significant problem now and this is a massive challenge. So it needs to be clear, continuous and consistent from my perspective. Brilliant. Thank you, John. And and if I just can just um, conclude with the artists, I'm I'm very aware that uh, you know you, you both have different types of practices. You work very much with with the housing sector as commercial artists, and you also work with communities as socially engaged artists, as well as obviously this project with scientists. So you've got quite a broad spectrum of people that you engage with on a regular basis um, and I'm interested in in how you feel the behavioral change 
could come about if we could find more mechanisms or what mechanisms we might have to work to work better together? I mean, I've actually not not just necessarily working best together, but I've actually got an example of of how something has actually worked already in that um, I was with somebody yesterday who was looking at the uh, brochure of the, the photographs that we've got in the gallery. And in the brochure, there's, as there is on the walls in the gallery, there's text by Richard and there's text by us. And um, they were particularly engaged by the photograph that is, there's a photograph that we've reimagined the small bedroom in the house as a nursery. And they were fascinated by the fact of the, the temperature that Richard had said was the best temperature to have for a baby's room. And it was, that they, they, it hadn't occurred to them before what would be the best temperature for a baby's room. So within just like a few minutes, somebody had sort of had a piece of information they never had before mm. because they come to an art gallery, really. And they had this piece of information about what was the best because, because Richard has his information in the gallery and in that brochure. That, that they weren't aware of before. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, that those conversations are the conversations that John's talking about, and I'm sure the conversations that we'll take forward. And um, I know from our perspective, because the majority of the work that we do isn't in the gallery, the majority of the work that we do is out in communities via all the residencies we have with the different communities across, across the city region. So from our perspective, it's actually taking that uh, for us, it's taking those conversations out and making sure that we're taking those conversations out into the communities that we work with and actually listening. And for us, it's listening to people because a lot of people have a lot of, um, once you start a conversation, have a lot of their own ideas mm -hmm. about how they would like to take this forward. And it's bringing those two, that expertise that people have in their own lives together with the expertise of photographers, the expertise of scientists and and um, politicians and agencies that are working on the ground. That's that's our kind of sense of how we might go forward. Yeah, well, I think I think uh, the idea is bringing it home, I think, is, is also important. Like John said, you know, photographs of glaciers melting or, you know, the, the Sudan, all very important work. But how does that affect ordinary people in Nosley, for instance, you know, and I think um, part of our agenda was to, and I think Richard as well, by looking at a sort of, you know, a traditionally brick built home, you're bringing those issues home, you're bringing those issues into real people's homes within, in our case, the Liverpool city region. Mm. Yes, I'm, I'm get, um, I, I think I think that that's right. I wonder, does anybody have any other thoughts before we close or we've, we've sort of run out of time? Um, if not, I'd like to thank you all so much. It's been a really interesting discussion um, and just remind everybody that we have 30, or 30 odd organisations and community groups working with us with similar discussions over the next few months um, dealing with the different areas of climate change. Um, so please do come into the gallery and join in with us on those discussions. Thank you so much for coming and spending your time today. Um, we will be sharing this more broadly, um, this recording more broadly with the, the broader community. And we look forward to anybody out there that's watching this that would like to get in contact with us and has any thoughts or would like to do anything with us in relation to the climate agenda, please do get in contact. Thank you very much. <laughs>